Okay, <coughs> so I'm going to talk about definitions. We tend to think of mathematical definitions as like perfect little jewels fixed for all time. Uh, the definitions really aren't like that. We make up definitions for our own convenience. Um, I have three goals for this session. Um, first, to confuse you about as many definitions as concepts as possible. Um, second, perhaps to prompt you to go away and discuss some of these concepts and clarify them afterwards. And then generally to discuss the status of definitions in mathematics. And up first, a famous example, trapezoid. Um, so what's your definition of trapezoid? Exactly one pair of parallel sides, or at least one pair of parallel sides. It makes a difference. A parallelogram is or is not the trapezoid, depending on which definition you pick. And there are plenty of places in geometry where we have a choice between making one of these inclusive or exclusive definitions. And it's interesting, the further back in time you go, the more you see exclusive definitions. Everything in Euclid is exclusive. A rhombus in Euclid cannot be a square. An oblong is not a square. Come a little bit later, a rhombus can be a square, but a trapezoid still can't be a parallelogram. <laughs> trapezoid, trapezoid is the one holdout. Um, but actually, I think even this might be changing. I Googled definition of trapezoid yesterday, and I was rather surprised that the top hits seemed overwhelmingly to go for the inclusive definition. So we may finally be coming to resolution of trapezoid. <laughs> My next example, angle, and this actually comes from a question that a teacher asked me a couple of years ago. Everybody pretty much agrees that an angle is formed with two rays or two half lines. The question really is, in your definition, do you allow the two rays to coincide so that you really only have one ray? Uh, too many authors are ambiguous about this. Wu is one who's pretty clear that you are allowed to do that, but it's not the only answer. Here's an author who says you can't, and uh, he doesn't even allow 180 degree angles either. Um, is there a zero degree angle? It depends on your definition of angle. Fractions, well there's lots to be said about fractions, but the thing I want to bring up here is that for me, growing up, a fraction was always a symbol. Not the number itself, but the symbol. So I could write 2 thirds equals 4 sixths, and I wouldn't be saying the scratches on paper were the same, I'd be saying the underlying quantities were the same. So I was a little surprised to read a couple of years ago in the common core glossary that a fraction is supposed to be now a number. That's okay, they can do that, they can define fraction any way they want, but I'm going to have to be flexible and just adjust my thinking if I'm going to use that definition of fraction. From equality of fractions to equations in general, an equation is simply a statement that the two expressions are equal. Um, like any statement, equations can be true or false. I put this one up here because, again, another teacher questioned once that first example there, is that an equation? It's a statement that two expressions are equal, but I don't think I want a student to tell me that that's an equation. The second one, by the way, certainly is an equation, it's just an equation that happens to be false. <laughs> <laughs> Some equations can't be false, they've got variables in them, um, they're true no matter what number the variable represents. We call those equations identities. Um, you're actually going to see two equations in the next slide. Concentrate on the second one. Is the second one an identity? Uh, the answer obviously is no, because if x stands for 1, the two sides of the equation are not equal. Uh, nevertheless, a lot of algebra textbooks will call this an identity. Most calculus textbooks will not because by the time students get to calculus, they're supposed to be thinking in terms of functions and not expressions, and it makes a difference. This was my poor slide. I learned this trick from Steve Lyman. I thought that was <laughs> <laughs> um, Common Core defines function twice, once in grade eight and once in high school. The basic idea is the same both times. A function is a rule that assigns to each input exactly one output. It took a long time to get to that definition. The definition of function changed a lot over time. If you want to see people that personally go to that Wikipedia page, they're very passionate about their definition. <laughs> but if you get this input-output, very general definition of function, no x's, y's, whatever, it's an incredibly powerful uh, unifying concept that goes through all of that. So let me try and sum up a little bit. We certainly need careful, precise definitions if we're going to carry a mathematical reasoning, mathematical discourse. But we've seen the definitions are fuzzy. They change in all of these ways. They change over time, they change with our mathematical experience, and so on. So what do we do? We, in the end, we settle for definitions that are good enough for crap, for all practical purposes. <laughs> not, <laughs> not to the this job well in that. In any individual conversation, we have to agree what our definitions are, but we have to be flexible too. We have to change as we go along and as necessary. 
One final definition, Bertrand Russell in mathematics is the subject in which we never know what we're talking about, nor whether what we're saying is true. Secondly, <laughs> Russell's statement is true, but if we're careful and flexible with definitions, we can make a false fact. Thank you.